Kit in the Mystic Forest, Act 2B, The Forest and the Father, Part 30, Beating Ground 1, A Comfort to a Poor Little Girl. With cure in hand, but no way to leave the forest, Kit found hope an easy thing to abandon. She couldn't answer why, but she found her body compelled to move deeper into the forest yet again. She walked in silence and remembered her father's warning. She walked more and remembered Solomon's warning. She walked further until her legs buckled from numbness. It was then that she dropped to the ground and curled herself into a tight little ball. So tight and small she curled, one might think she was trying to disappear from this world. This is when she heard it, the beat beat beating of the ground. It resembled a pulsating heart, a sound that always comforted her. She, the girl Kit, breathed in deeply and let the rhythm and rhyme console her being. She remembered times when her family was a whole and decided this was her goal. She stood up and wiped the dirt from her clothes. Her resolve was renewed. If she couldn't get to her mother, then she'll find her father at once. Part 31, where to go next? It was nice that she had a new goal, something to keep her mind far, far away from recent upsets. She would search for her father lost within the forest's rim. It was nice, indeed, except for the fact that she had no idea as to where to start. The forest was big and foreign to her steel. A mere child could wander eons without the inkling of a hint. She thought, she paced, she said, no good to wandering. So the girl did the only thing she could think to do and said hello to a Solomon tree. The great tree Solomon lent her an ear and was deeply saddened by her predicament. He had warned her of this fate that she did remember. And in a voice as big as he was tall, Solomon said he could not help. However, he suggested that she go and take a peek at the book in which she carried the one we all know, the Book of Words. Part 32, Not Once Ever. To use the book, the one of words had never, not once ever, entered the little girl's mind. Had she wasted some time to give Solomon's ideal a name, it would have been brilliant. However, she wasted no time and immediately opened the book and paid for an answer, anything of use. Kit soon remembered how the book's modest size hid its endless pages. She made a quick decision to forget that fact again as a way to steal her resolve. After a while, the kid did find an arcane to locate. With an item of her father's, she chose his bag, and words from a fairy, she hoped she'll do, was all that was needed to bring forth a trail. On one end was Kit, and on the other, perhaps a lost Bailey of the woods. Part 33, is he here? The path made by the book's arcane was a sparkling, ghostly line of blue. It weaved round trees and slid down hills, made twists and turns, and swam across river banks. In the end, the path had led the girl to one of the forest's countless clearings. But there was nothing here, nothing again. Only the same old trees and grass and far off sky she's seen just about everywhere here. She asked out loud to any who could hear, my father, is he here? Part 34, 
Part 34, Beating Ground 2, The Familiarity of That Rhythm and Rhyme. She asked the trees if they could talk. When she found they could not, she climbed them instead. Her father was not somewhere on high. She checked the bushes down below, every one. Only small animals and berries were uncovered. A small cave was nearby, so she checked it true, yet it too proved false. Nothing, nothing was here. When the girl went back to the clearing to pace and think of what to do next, she heard it, a thump, thump, thump. Her neck twisted then shifted as she looked for its source. Again, the ground. She put her ear to the ground and heard it was alive. The thump, thump, thump was the beat, beat, beating of a heart. That rhythm and rhyme were familiar, something she could never mistake. Part 35, they saw her. In the hollows of trees, or circling between treetops and cloud bottoms, or hiding in far off shade, the dwellers of the forest watched the girl with astute attention, digging for something, no, someone she hoped was there. On her knees in dirty clothes, digging with sticks and twigs until they broke, or pounding away with rocks until they crumbled, or clawing with her bare little fingers, blisters be damned. They saw her face painted with a blend of dried blood and tear-mixed mud. But most of all, and this is important, they saw her fierce determination. They saw fear and failure only slowed, not stopped her. They saw her. The birds were moved first. They could be idlers no longer. They swarmed round Kit and dropped off supplies, twigs and rocks and other useful things. And by her side, a familiar little bird clawed and pecked at the ground. The code of the forest was changing once again. The fairies were next. They sent word throughout the forest that this brave part fairy girl needed assistance and that support was a must. Even far off Solomon motioned to help, rising a giant root from the ground, which seemed to float itself away. Part 36, with a little help from my friends. In what very well may have been the whole of the forest helping, it was still not enough. The beating grew louder, but lay always out of reach. Kit would not give up, but would her tail end here? Simply a memory encapsulated in time? A daughter forever digging for something that may not even be. An answer came from the depths of the forest. Though its meaning could not yet be understood, its baritone wailing could be heard approaching the clearing. All stopped and looked, all moved from the apparent path. Dragging Solomon's strong root by its side was a massive translucent beast. It entered the clearing and stood tall before the child. Even the trees had to look up to its impressive verticality. Kit looked up as best she could, pointed to the ground and said, It's not enough. Then in a voice much bigger, making sure it would reach, said, I need your help. The giant, in reply, plunged its root into the ground with terrifying force, dividing the land instantly. This was his answer to Kit's plea. Part 37, Beating Ground 3, Eyes That Won't Flinch. When the ground was finally open, it was not victory that confronted them, but agony. Their eyes, unflinching in horror, forced to see, saw that the land was living, no, rather composed of the living. Thousands upon thousands of bodies, mangled and contorted, ripped and battered, screaming and moaning, and yet
that still beating. It was awful. Sights, sounds, smells, all awful. And indeed, among them was in fact the girl's father, Bailey Woods, with heart external chest beating, beating, still very much beating, adorned in red and meat. Yes, she had found her father, and she could not look away. Part 38 For Those Who Should Not Be Evermore, Fairy of the Forest, held Kit, daughter of Bailey, in her arms, trying to shield her small old eyes from the cruel sight. The kid needed to see, needed to know what had happened. She called out with voice wavering, and Bailey did hear. He answered weakly, all previous strength lost. He told his daughter that he had much to explain, starting with the fact that he was born of sand and dirt. He was, in fact, a golem brought to life by this very forest. And now, he has cruelly been returned, returned here, to this earthly prison, by someone who sees him, his family, in this forest as abominations that must be cleansed. Part 39, The Legend 4, A Man in a Town Bailey had a story to tell his little girl. It was an old tale about a man in a town. It began with that town accepting this man, this foreigner, and allowing him to stay and live amongst their elk. In reply to their kindness, the foreigner worked hard and all was well. At least it seems so on the surface, but in truth, the townspeople lived with hearts heavy, and the man did notice. The foreigner had a talk with the mayor, and though hesitant at first, he recited the legend of the town. Long ago, long before the mayor's time, long before his father's time, long still before his father's father's time, a great calamity has struck the town and its people. It plagued the town for many moons and threatened to erase it from the world itself. But then came a glow from the forest and the disaster had ended. The town was saved and the forest had become sacred. The mayor could see the look of confusion upon the foreigner's face. He of course knew why. His tale was thus far incomplete. He explained their dread. There was a prophecy. The calamity will return and finish this deed. The town would be lost, never to appear again. He explained their sorrow. There was a way to prevent the calamity, a hollow tome, a text of all. The book of words it was called could save them all. However, the mayor continued that the book stayed within the forest's keep, entrance of which was deemed forbidden as anyone who enters and leaves, leaves with the calamity's curse and curses all where he goes. The dilemma was thus, the town could either wait for their end or bring it upon themselves. This, it seemed, was their fate. It was a true tragedy indeed, but this man, this foreigner, had a grand little secret. He was born of the forest, made literally from his hollow grounds, and it seemed to him that he was not cursed. Where he walked, nothing was blessed or doomed. So this man who was taken in and clothed, given shelter and work, praised and loved by this town and his people, sought to save it. He would break their ironclad laws, enter the forest, and retrieve the book. Only when he did, it was not salvation that he brought, but a terrible plague that ripped through the land. Many became lost. And though this man would rid his home of the curse, he had to go, forever banish. This was Bailey's story. This was what he had done. 
And this is why years later, the mayor now owed would do what he had done. Part 40, Bailey's Lament. Bailey had encountered the old mayor. It was he who imprisoned him here. Talking with that man, he told his daughter that he learned a great many things. Assumptions pieced together from a madman's ravings, though he was sure that they were more true than false. The town, once beautiful, had now changed. Warped was his people's minds, warped by fear and paranoia. They had done a great many ill acts to keep themselves safe from another horrible plague. And at his disturbed center was Thaddeus Johansson, the old mayor. Somewhere between Bailey's banishment and now, the old mayor had found out about Bailey's little secret. He believed that Bailey was the true second coming of the calamity, an abomination breathed in life only to take it away. So he cursed Lorelei as a way to lure him here to the forest. He believed his deeds would help restore the natural order, the balance. The old mayor was truly lost. Bailey lamented, saying the thought was his own. He had brought the town to his knees, drove a friend to madness, let his wife become poison, and left his daughter alone. Disgusting. This was the only word he could think to describe himself. He lowered his head, unable to look at his daughter anymore, and cried, Forgive me, Lorelai. Forgive me, Kit. Part 41, Cruel Truths. The girl Kit, daughter of Bailey, screamed to her father that he wasn't a failure, wasn't an abomination, not to her, not to anyone. This situation was something she couldn't, no, wouldn't accept. She threw down her bag and took out the book. Her father asked her to stop, but stubbornness became her. Her goal was to save them both. Nothing had changed. She paged through the book, searching, hoping for another miracle. Then Bailey called out again, this time in a frighteningly commanding tone. A way may very well be in that book, he said through pain voice. But too much time had passed. He was Earth once more. Quiet was the force until a golem named Bailey spoke out again. He told of a way, a last resort, that Kit may leave the forest and reach her poor, ailing mother, Lorelai. If she would partake in the flesh of a golem's still beating heart, then the forest would allow her to return to the world temporal, if just for a spell. Quiet was the girl, upon hearing truths all too cruel. Part 42, Halo of Honey. Rise into the heart of Bailey, up towards the surface world, up towards the martyr's daughter, beating and pulsing, beating and pulsing the heart went. Every pump of the cardinal organ made the girl's eyes widen and stomach churn, she heaved as color flushed from her face. With mouth agape, she took the heart into her shaking hands and held it to her chest. Beat, beat, beating. A familiar sound, a familiar feel. She sobbed quietly to herself. She couldn't, she refused, for the toll on her own heart was now too great. A girl so small should not need to do deeds so big, so cruel. She refused. 
she refused. Part 43, Love One, Father and Daughter. No matter the necessity, what a terrible thing to ask of one's own child. Lamenting this fact, Bailey of the woods, now of the ground, can only muster how sorry he was. His young daughter, calming herself to the beat of his external heart, Wish for a small family to be a whole once more. Words left her mouth to much the same tone, though they both understood that that may never be. He pleaded again with his daughter Kit. Better to lose one than to lose all three. The girl thought for a moment. She would accept. If this pitiful girl had more tears to cry, more sorrow to show, she would have done just that, but alas, the forest had robbed her of those as well. This brave and pitiful girl named Kit told her father, with much love and sadness, goodbye, and consumed his heart. Part 44, Another World 2. The ground fell silent, no more screaming or moaning, torn of all color and life. The earth became cold. Evermore, Fairy of the Forest wanted to say something, anything to the girl, but nothing came. Not words or whisper, not even a whimper. Kit rose to her feet and walked away in a daze. Was it worth it? It was worth it, were phrases she thought. The forest dwellers made way for the girl and dared not speak and dared not follow. I and am and alone were words that made a phrase that came in and out of her head. A phrase she realized never meant a thing to a little girl like her but now meant so much. Heart, the word sickened her. 
so much she thought she'd puke. But she tried her best not to, for what was inside her needed to stay. It was her only way to save her mother and her last and final connection to her father. Looking round, she thought she must be in another world. Nothing looked magical anymore. Part 45, Ghostly Murmurs. Once more at the forest's entrance, Kit held her breath, thinking it may ward off unwanted half-men, half-animal guardians. She passed over to the other side, though nothing felt any different. She exhaled. And as she jumped on Rory, her noble horse, a ghostly figure didn't murmur in ear. Part 46, Love 2, Mother and Daughter. Back at her home, the drained little girl could not muster the strength to be shocked at her poor mother's present condition. Completely wrapped in a cocoon of tree bark, with white fuzz growing like moss in her shell. Lorelei's state was completely inhuman. Roots from the shell had pierced various points of adjacent space, giving no care that this used to be a place where people once lived. Quietly, Kit opened her father's satchel and took out the pink salve. She tended the roots as best she could, then rubbed the salve on what had become her mother's body. When she was done, she got close to her mother's side and fell asleep. The morning came too soon, yet not without some relief. Her mother's form, while still not human, had seemed to have regressed, if only just a little. Kit smiled. She tended to some more roots and poured the last of the salve on her mother's less monstrous form. When she was done, she could feel the ghastly presence of what she now thought of as half-human, no-hearted scum. Wait, was the first word she spoke that day. She wrote her mother a letter, hugged what she could of her, and said two more words, love and you. With guardians on either side, the then-living kid known as Kit exited her home. Rory, the woods' steed, started to pursue, but soon stopped as there was nothing left to follow, hold a small whisper of goodbye. Kit in the Mystic Forest was written by T.O. Coleman, performed by Apostrophe H, with original music remix by Red Adachi. And as always, we give a very special thanks to our audience for listening. Hope you enjoyed. Next time, Act 3, Mother and Family.